put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Alan Wake, American Nightmare, PC Game Review. Alan is where he was when when we last saw him. Let's let's go with that. And he is now facing a basically an evil twin version of himself, as some in this refer to him as. Mr. Ksh. Okay, technically it's Mr. Scratch, but every single time the, the scratch is supposed to be uttered, we hear like a record scratch or, or television static. So, it's difficult to describe the plot here without spoiling the, the Alan Wake game itself and the two DLC chapters for Alan Wake, but basically Alan continues to possess the ability to change things, and he and Mr. Scratch are basically... There's, there's a fight there, you know, the... the traditional protagonist-antagonist thing, although it does remain fairly unclear what Scratch's motive or the limitations to his power, yeah, these, these kinds of things. So anyway, yeah, basically Alan is now stuck in a time loop, which Mr. Scratch wants to keep him in, but yes, I, th I think that about covers it for the plot. Basically, will Alan be able to escape the time loop? And the whole thing is framed as an episode of the Twilight Zone-esque Night Springs, and it's, it's set in Night Springs, Arizona, where the first one was this very, you know, small town kind of, you know, we don't get many visitors from, you know, this, this kind of thing. It, you know, the, the Stephen King main small town kind of thing. This, yes, is set in, in Arizona. And I suppose the, the time loop is a good place to start. That, as a, as a concept, does fit with the, the universe, the, the world that was set up in Alan Wake, the game. And it's, it's done fairly well here. It's, it's a rather short game. It took me three hours to complete. So, literally, you could do it in a single sitting. And, in a way, you might say that that is almost the, you know, that's an appropriate way to try to explore this whole time loop kind of thing. Because, yes, you do go to the same places in this. So, literally, this kind of thing is going to wear thin quick. It's, you know, the, the first one had this kind of, you know, toying with, with what is real and, and what is not kind of thing, but it also had a number of different locations. And where this one has much more limited 
number of locations. Yeah, it's it's best that it's not very long. And and don't get me wrong, you're not doing the exact same thing on the different iterations of the time loop, but you are going to the same locations and some of the goals are ultimately the same. However, this this concept could be done in a more interesting way. I see like a I don't, I don't know for sure if this does, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't already exist, I don't know about all games, but I, I could see it being explored in a, a straight-up adventure game, not, not particularly an action game, but, you know, not, not action-adventure, which this in part is, but a straight-up adventure game with a time limit before the next loop. So basically, you're going around, you're finding clues, you're solving puzzles, finding out exactly how things should be in order for the time loop to go the way it should. Heck, maybe you have a number of different scenarios, and each time you've completed one scenario before the time loop, you know, throws you back to the start of that scenario, you proceed to the next scenario, and over the course of it, you know, you meet different characters, you have an, an engaging plot, maybe you discover what exactly is the origin of this time loop, you know, I, and this could easily be longer than three hours, and be very compelling, and while, as I said, this is a fine execution of the whole time loop idea, the rest of what I just said does not is is not present yet. I've already mentioned that we do not have very many different locations and where th there, there are no puzzles in this. Like literally there there are things that could almost qualify as puzzles like where you, well you gotta flip some switches in order to accomplish something and well you know what is what is the exact configuration of these switches but it's so easy this this barely qualifies as an as as part adventure. You know, you gotta pick up some things and use them specifically to specific places, and then you have these quasi faux puzzles. But that's it. It's basically just a shooter, a third person shooter, which you know basically is fine. But again, this is a follow up to Alan Wake, which is not a sequel. It is not the sequel that, you know, they, they are, Remedy is intending to do a sequel, and I'm still very, you know, I, I do hope that that comes out, because Alan Wake, the first one, was a really gripping gaming experience, but it was that because of the story, because of the gradual, you know, build-up of atmosphere, there's this, in, in Alan Wake 1, you go through these various settings, and first it's during the day, and you see, like, you know, you, you, you see various things that, that seem quaint, and, and, you know, yeah, this is a place you might vacation, you're, you're sure it's nice to live here, with, with nature all around you, and then it's night time. And Alan still has to go through, he's going through some of these same areas, but now what was quaint before is suddenly very threatening. You know, the, the forest, which while abandoned, still seemed like, you know, well, you know, cradle of nature, this is, this is a nice place to go and just relax. But now, when, when it's dark, and, you know, suddenly it feels like everything in the forest is a threat to you, and... This game has nothing like that. This entire game is set at night. And that also brings up, the, like I said before, what are Mr. Scratch's limitations? Because in the first one, it's very clear what the limitations of the antagonist is. And here, yeah, it seems like it's constantly... There, there doesn't seem to be any reason for Mr. Scratch to not constantly be dominating you know, things. It, it doesn't really feel like anything Alan is doing should be a setback to Mr. Scratch. You know, except for some things he does to, you know, with the whole time loop thing. But 
what I'm saying is, in the first one, it was very clear that, you know, either Alan was specifically doing something that should, like, fight off the, the, the darkness, and, and, or he was fighting through the darkness to get to the next clue as to what to do. And here, it's just, you know, for, for a three-hour game, and this is not necessarily going to be a surprise to others who've played short games, this does get pretty tedious and tiring. It doesn't, you know, in part because of all this repeated, you know, th these repeated settings and the like, but, yeah. So, that's, that's one thing. Another is that there are, excuse me, there are su supporting characters in this, or, yeah, I suppose, you might almost call them, you know, main, main characters, but anyway, they're here, but mostly it's uh, so that Alan isn't just talking to himself. There is nothing there. There isn't really anything particularly explored. There's not much of, like, an arc with this thing. Like, I mean, things go differently in the different time loops, but it's not really this interesting kind of... If you took away the characters, and Alan learnt from the characters, what he now learns from the characters, if he learnt that through just finding, you know, these manuscript pages, which are now stripped of subtlety, and where, in the first one, there were these compelling, foreboding, like, they describe things that have not happened yet, and you're like, oh, that, you know, when is that going to happen? How do I deal with that? And in some cases, could I prevent that? You know, and here, they're just instruction manuals. It's just, you know, yeah, Alan wrote these messages to himself so that he'd know what to do, and this is where some of this, you know, non-puzzle stuff comes in. They're basically, they're, they are instruction manuals, like, they literally do have just this, you know, this, this stuff of, they tell you what to do, basically. Now, that's one thing. The other is the plot, which some have said it's, you know, nonsensical. I don't quite agree, though it is, as others have pointed out, rather pointless. It literally exists, again, as others have pointed out, to get you through the story mode. And that's it. That's literally... It doesn't... I realize that some... I mean, this is DLC, which is, you know, obviously the, the new term for it. This particular DLC is what would have been an expansion pack. You know, this is like, you know, opposing force to Half-Life, or more, more likely, blue shift to Half-Life. You know, this is that thing where, you know, you play it, you don't play it, it doesn't really go in and affect too much. Because if it did, then you'd need to play it. It's not the sequel, you know, so... It's, it's not a full product. And it's very much... Yeah, it's, it's, they, the Remedy refers to this as an in-universe spin-off, not a sequel. And yet, yeah, it, it does take place within that same world, but perhaps in part because this is framed as an episode of Night Springs, everything, literally everything in this is just, you know, is this really happening kind of thing. Like, literally the first thing you see in this is... Barry, who unfortunately, for the rest of this, only really... Barry does not appear too much in this, but he is... You do hear him some on the, on the radio, because he is now the, the agent, the manager, for the old gods of Asgard, which is a, a nice little nod to... Yeah, it's, it's something that was 
it's a reference. Let's let's go with that. And yeah, so it starts with Barry asleep in a motel room with the TV on playing Night Springs. And then the, the camera goes into the television screen and we're seeing what's going on with Alan. In fact, it, it opens pretty much with Alan, you know, like a close-up of his eye and, and his eye opens, which obviously tells us that this is going to have a decisive ending and that we will be rewarded for engaging with the mysteries of it. So anyway, yes, Alan is in Night Springs, the show, and the town, I guess, of Arizona. And everything that happens from that point on is, is fiction, you know, it's not, it's not really necessarily happening to Alan. Or is it, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's entirely pointless. And where... This is, this is somewhat like the DLC for the first, the, the two chapters that took place after the events of, of the first game. In that, again, this, the story doesn't necessarily really progress too much, and it is this thing of, you don't really need to have played it in order to... Now, on my review of the first, I said, and I stand by that, that if the if these two chapters, DLC, are not free, I wouldn't necessarily spend money on them. Like, if you don't get them for free with your copy of Alan Wake, don't go out of your way to buy them. They don't really add that much. With that said, they are definitely more compelling than this. It's... You know, the, the length is, if I recall, those were maybe like two hours, but that was so much more interesting. And they're actually, they're fairly similar. Both have Alan in this surreal existence where, yeah, some, some things are happening that, you know, and that one does have characters to it, and it's, it's actually... It's pretty meta, because Alan encounters characters that he met in the real world, in this surreal, you know, it's called the Dark Place, in, in the Dark Place, and his encounters with them now are colored by the realization that they're not real, so like, they'll, they'll, you know, have some back and forth, and they literally will say, well, you're not really here, and, and, like, the character might teleport from, like, if Alan is passing them, and they're just sitting, they're sitting here, he walks past them, and suddenly they're over here, you know, so they're, they're in front of him all, and it's just, they have a lot of fun with it there, and this has nothing like that. I'm not saying they necessarily should have done that again with characters, but, yeah, that one has compelling character stuff, and that one, where both are surreal, that one has these sudden eruptions of strange phenomena, like something will, like if you're walking through a cavern of sorts, suddenly something might, like, like rock will grow out of the ground to try to stop you, and it's just... Yeah, it, it just really has the... It's, it's somewhat like a dream. It's like being stuck in someone's paranoid delusions. And it's, it's very, you know... Not quite Freddy Krueger, but it, in that general direction. You know, it's, it's not like knives and... It's, it's slightly, you know, longer fingernails. Is is the the you know that's that's the ball game we're talking about, and that is at least fun and you know it might not add a lot to the overall story, but it's it's fun and it it does kind of you know it sticks with you and. While I did just beat this game, I have a feeling it's not going to stick with me. 
And now to, to give some examples of how it's surreal, one of the first things that happens in this is that you put on a Kasabian CD that plays Club Foot. And please don't ask me what the meaning of that title is. I had heard the song before this, but it's not really too much my kind of music. I mean, I like the, the song. In general, I, I like some Kasabian, but yeah, you put on a Kasabian CD and, you know, it's not the only thing you do, but you put on a Kasabian CD and this is part of it. There's like a ritual you have to do and an asteroid hits a satellite and the satellite comes crashing down and destroys a, like an, an oil tower, oil well kind of thing. I wish I could say that the game continues that level of pure WTF insan insanity, insaneness, but it, it doesn't. That, that kind of is one of the most outlandish things that happened in this. I, maybe they kind of, you know, they pulled up Hughes Anderson did. You know, they, they went to the to the top too far with not enough build up and yeah, the yeah, so now the the cutscenes tend to be live action in this and there is some good stuff to this when you find a TV in this, it's 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 a cute little thing where in the first Alan Wake, when you find a TV, and if you turn it on, it's gonna play a an episode of Night Springs. And these are of course really, really short, like a minute or two. And so you you sort of see this very Twilight Zone. By the way, in in part of it being framed as an episode, yes, we have a Rod Serling sound alike who speaks in this kind of, you know, a man trapped in a dark alternate dimension, having to fight his evil double. What will come of this? Find out tonight, in Night Springs, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I really, I'm, I'm not exactly a sort of impersonator. The guy who does this is, however. And yeah, so in the first game, Turn On a TV is an episode of Night Springs turn on a TV in this Night Springs, and you see something real. So that's that's a cute little... Th yeah. And what you see is Mr. Scratch going around. Basically, you're, you're chasing Mr. Scratch. You know, it's, it's that typical thing of finding out where exactly did he go by... You know, you find an area that he did attack, and you get some hints as to where he may now be, so you pursue him there. And every so often he will appear in person and taunt Alan. Now, what you see in these, uh, you know, basically he's left recordings of himself for you. It's not that you're spying in on him. He, he did these recordings for you, and he's always kind of He's, he's clearly a very cruel, sadistic individual. He, he has this kind of serial killer thing going on. It's, it's, he's very creepy in these, in these recordings. And he'll, like, show that he's, you know, he's, he's torturing someone on camera, or he's just gotten done torturing, or he'll, you know... There's, there's one which, which really... Is a, is a good example of it. He, he turns the camera to this... Usually he's like talking to the camera. <laughs> what a crazy idea. But in this one, he picks up the camera and turns it to his kill tools. And he picks up these, these knives and different things and he talks about, you know, I use this for this and that and I know what you're thinking, what, you know, what good is this, but, you know, I'm going to explain to you exactly what is, what is so useful about this particular blade, and, and this, and, yeah, it's, it's quite nicely done, like that, that's one of the better.
parts of this. As you can maybe tell, this is somewhat of a mixed bag. It's not all bad. Now, the, the tone has changed quite a bit. You know, they really like to end their games with, you know, the, the, the eponymous, you know, the, the game's head stating that their eponymous protagonist's journey will continue into the night. And I like to joke that this is, of course, barring that another company takes over their, you know, their product and completely changes the tone. And this one, they beat Rockstar to the punch by changing the tone themselves. And, you know, actually, now to think, now, come to think of it, they turned out more or less the same. Although, you know, Max Payne 3 does have a pretty good multiplayer experience. Now, anyway, the, the tone now is this more kind of, yeah, off the wall kind of thing. Now, the I also saw some reviewers state that this explains things from the first. I don't completely see that. I maybe Mr. Scratch himself, but yeah, not not enough that they don't explore him enough. I would say. You know, all we all we really know is that he's, like I said, a creepy, sadistic this, this son of a bitch. Now, the the dialogue can be a bit odd. I do like that they, you know, they do this thing of you know time loop, of you know, like the characters Alan meets and Alan himself have. You know, they realize that they've been here before, when the time loop starts over. So, over the course of it, they kind of, they realize more and more, okay, really shouldn't have done that, and this sort of thing. So it's it's somewhat of a traditional story in that sense. And in, you know, when talking time loop stories. And, yeah, the dialogue for some of that can be interesting. But yeah, a lot of the dialogue is kind of... It's, it's okay. Now, and I will say there is like a line or two that are kind of funny or clever. Now, this does have the, oh, before I, I do want to mention the, the Kasabian, you know, song, it does really fit the, the situation, you know, so, yeah. The the real purpose of this is of course the what you might call survival mode. It's it's called arcade mode here, but literally it is you know, you're in an arena and you have to it's it says like survive until dawn, you know. And with the ten minute timer and everything. And yeah, you basically have to survive wave after wave of increasingly tougher opponents and yeah this is this is pretty decently done. I mean it's it's nice and open and the the openness of these arenas, the limited carry capacity, you know, you can carry three to five extra clips and it's still just you know, you have the one sidearm, the one two-handed weapon the flare gun, and then flares, and not and or, flashbangs, and that's, you know, so, yeah, with, with all of that, you do have your work cut out for you, you know, and I can see how, you know, with the first game, how you might think, you know, where, where it came from when Remedy sat down and, 
and did this mode, you know, did the arcade mode for this. Now, basically, there are five arenas for this, and there are the two, yes, two difficulty settings for this, so you have to play through them and do well on the different ones in order to unlock more. When you start, only one of them will be available to you. And, yeah, the there, there are, you know, online international leaderboards, and I think that's about it for, for that mode. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's well done enough, but it really doesn't... It feels like the story mode was done in order to flesh this out, to not make this seem like such a... I mean, I realized that a lot, you know, a lot. There are other games today where basically it's there, you know, the game is there, the, the single player portion of the game is more or less there in order to not have it just be like a, you know, multiplayer title, <laughs> X-Pain 3. And the thing here is, it does not really warrant this being, like, something you, you actually pay money for. I'd, I'd say that at least for those of us who did buy the first game, I feel like this should be a free DLC for us. Like, not too terribly long ago, Deus Ex 3, Deus Ex Human Revolution, and it's DLC, and those two are, you know, usually... Actually, I don't f for sure recall if... Never mind. Those two were assembled into one full thing because, you know, the, the DLC, the, the missing link, takes place at a certain point during the overall story of the human revolution, so they got that and put the whole thing together, put it in chronological order. And while that was something you had to buy, those of us who already had human revolution, and possibly we did also have to have the missing link, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't remember if you have to pay for the missing link anyway, or if you had to pay, because as far as I can tell now, you can only really get, or at least on Steam, you can only get the full thing. Anyway, there was a, you know, a substantial discount for those of us who might buy this new package, you know, and they did different things on that, I mean, they, they redid some graphics, there's... I don't remember the full list, but they did do stuff, so it's not, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you necessarily, I, I mean, I'll be upfront, I didn't buy it, but that's also in part because I don't think that it should be in chronological order, and I'm getting way off topic here. What I'm saying is, they put it at a discount for those who already had it, and what I'm saying is, this expansion pack should basically just have been the arcade mode, and it should just have been... It should have been free for those of us who already had Alan Wake. I th the idea here is that we're supposed to, you know, this is supposed to attract new players to Alan Wake, and I'm not sure how much that's... that's our, again, if, if it was just the, the, the arcade mode, then, then maybe, but if you haven't already played Alan Wake and you try to go into the, the story mode here, I don't think it's going to be that interesting. I guess it's also, it does not help that this Alan Wake spent its entire game time of, of about nine and a half hours setting up and exploring the the actual events, what is what is really going on. And it's kind of you know, it it did it, it did it really well, telling us just enough to 
forward the plot and to keep us really engaged, and then, you know, it, it was very much like a television series. Each episode had just enough to keep us coming back, but not enough that it gives away the twist or, or something along those lines. And in this, it there is no, there is not much in the way of introduction to the concept that the first game spent so long setting up and properly exploring. And where the first one has such excellent pacing, this one is rather... It's, it's okay at best. Like, you're not constantly under attack. It has that kind of pacing, but... You know, and sure, the story beats are also kind of... Like, as you go through the time loops, it does pick up speed, so you can tell when you're getting closer and closer to the ending. But it really doesn't spend enough time setting up what's going on, and yeah, if you if you don't already know the basic idea, you're you might be pretty lost in this. And yeah, it it starts with a massive exposition dump. And this isn't even the like a a recap of the events of the first. This is literally just... This is stuff that we should have seen not be told. Like, this, the opening is that Mr. Scratch tells Alan what's going on, more or less, and then Alan tells more of it to the characters he encounters. And, yeah, it's just very... Yeah, it's, it's not, well, it, the story is not well paced, you might say. And the, and there's also, there's action right at the start. It doesn't properly set, set the scene before we get into things, you know. Like I said, the first one starts with these comfortable, you know, sequences where, you know, at the start of each chapter, you're going through an area and it's the daytime, it's, it's very quaint and serene, and then it's, then, you know, we revisit it during the night, and it's now very dark and threatening. And here, it starts at night, and nothing really, yeah. It, it has nowhere else to particularly go from there, in, in that, you know, sense. Now, it's... Um, you might also say, you know, the, the first one arguably has too much action for the kind of psychological thriller that that is, and in this one there's even more action, so that, yeah. Again, not sure that this is going to attract that many people. I would say that they do a nice job of sort of setting them apart right from the get-go, where the, the, the main menu, the, the first image that greets you when, you when, you, when you're entirely inside the game, when you've seen the logos and this sort of, the first one is a silhouette of Alan. And, and, you know, it's, it's dark and it's kind of... In this one, he's standing in, like, a, a shirt, he's got a nail gun, and behind him passes the... I guess it's not the meteor, but the satellite. But anyway, anything... Anyway, something passes behind him. And, like, the image is slightly, you know, moving... It, it has a little bit of a grindhouse feel, you know. So, yeah. Now, the part of this is, of course, also that, yes, as, as, as I was saying, I'm not sure the action is really the thing that they should try to get more people in. I mean, gameplay is a really important aspect of it. I like to say that, I personally think that gameplay is the most important aspect of a video game. 
but the the gameplay of the first one, whilst you know there there was plenty of action, like I said, maybe a little too much. It was also these puzzles and this gradual exploration. You were going around seeing these seeing you know these these settings, this you know serene nature, and then it was much darker. You were very much chasing the next clue or fighting off the darkness and that's gone here. You might say that this is the action in a bit of a vacuum and when it comes down to that what many already noted about the first game is not really quite it's not Max Payne, you know, it's not a, a great third-person action shooter kind of shooting. Many have complained that the, the third person camera angle is a tad awkward. That hasn't changed here. And that again, that was fine when it wasn't that much about the shooting. The In the first one, you're in it for the story and the atmosphere. And in this one, those are gone. So, and the, the action has been upgraded for a while, I struggled to find out what people meant by upgraded, and then I realized I had already seen it, and it did not impress me. Basically, this has a few new guns, and a few new enemies. And that's it. Other than that, I mean, yeah, other than that, the, the action is essentially the same. So if you did not like the action in Alan Wake, you're not particularly going to like the action here. Now, as I've already mentioned, you have a limited carry capacity, and the Alan Wake action is that you're fighting off so-called Taken. They're, they're real people. They're like these blue-collar workers, like, you know, loggers, you know, ambulance, you know, EMTs, various things. And their weapons will be the tools of their trade. So the logger might have an axe. The the you know the fireman might have a fire you know fireman's axe. You know this this kind of stuff. And you they're they're covered by this black venom like you know, the Spider-Man villain substance that you have to remove because it it protects them. And you remove it by shining a light on them. Now, you always have a flashlight out, and you can just straight up point to them, but you can also focus the flashlight on them, boost the flashlight, it's called, and this will burn away the protection faster. Now, you can always shoot and you can always point the flashlight on them and boost, and shooting them will push them back slightly. If you point the flashlight at them, this will sort of briefly stun them. But note that, you know, if you're, if you're stunning one guy, that's not necessarily, you know, that doesn't mean that another can't attack you from, you know, another angle, even from right by him, you know, you're going to have to take them out. But this is all true regardless of how much of the, you know, of the dark essence is still on them. What you have to do is shine the light on them until the essence disappears, and then shoot them until they fully disappear. So, it's this great balance, and, and you can also dodge. if you it's, it's on the same key as the sprint key, and if you time it right, which does take a little getting used to, you can dodge their attack. And it's a great balance between these three. Who are you shining the light on? Who are you shooting? And when are you dodging? And both your weapons and your flashlight will need reloading. You have to put new batteries in the flashlight. It does also recharge, but this is much slower. It is somewhat faster in this than it was in the first one, but that's, again, me getting into territory of the first one did it better and had more time to flush it out. This one, it's... Nah. And... That's another thing, like, if you're, if you're putting a battery in the flashlight so you can't light away the, the dark essence, 
You can choose to try to dodge the guy in front of me, or you can shoot him to briefly stun him as you put the battery in. If you're reloading your gun, you can shine the light at them or dodge in order to get away from them. And I like to describe it as a, a you have to juggle the enemies, and this I find is a good way to general in, in general to approach this kind of action between, you know, it, you might say it's what you have to do in an RPG as well. You have to make sure that each enemy has been damaged or you're protecting against them or this kind of thing, you know. And, yeah, so you might be shining the light on one, then you gotta shoot another and dodge a third and all this stuff, and you can't always, like, just run away to a different place. You do have to... Or, you can sometimes run away entirely, but you don't, you don't want to rely on any of those three things entirely. You have to watch out, and yeah, and you will run out of batteries in Alan Wake, in this one there are so many, and you will run out of ammo. And then in this you just have to find a ammo refill station, and I, I need like a jar where I can, you know, for, for each time I talk about just how much this, you know, where the first one was really well paced, this one just has. But yeah, so, briefly on the, on the ammo refill boxes, you also have these, you know, there, there are these light, light posts that you have to run in under, and as long as you're in them, you're safe. And these tend to represent both healing, and that's really the only place you can heal, and the only way you can heal, and they also serve as checkpoint saves. And they're not the only checkpoint saves, but yeah. And the, the minimap, GPS kind of thing, has icons for these different things when you approach them. You know, also objective and there's this like question mark when you're in the approximate, you know, for for the approximate location of a manuscript page. And by the way, also manuscript pages, in addition to the story element that they serve in this and the original, they're now also necessary to unlock these boxes that contain certain weapons. And you know, the more manuscript pages that box takes to open, the more you know, high-grade weapon, that will be. Anyway, so that's the basic action of Alan Wake and this. In this, you get a few new weapons, I already mentioned the nail gun, you know, you've got uh, an SMG, you've got, you know, an assault rifle, a crossbow, these different kind of things, and I suppose that more or less covers it. So, so yeah, a handful overall of new weapons, and you know, and and uh, the the shotguns, the hunting rifle, and the handguns return from the first. Now, you might be able to tell a you know a bit of a difference in you know you've got assault rifles and SMGs versus handguns and shotguns and, and a hunting rifle. And yes, the hunting rifle is, you know, very accurate even at longer ranges, but also a bit slow to yeah. And that's again the thing where the first one is almost like a zombie shooter. You know, you've got the you've got handgun, you've got a shotgun, you know, these kinds of things, but that's about it. You you really have to be on top of your game, where in this you suddenly have these fully automatic weapons and this kind of thing. And this does fit with the different tone, but it does not fit that much with the same action. And I'm also not entirely sure that the Taken should still be the enemy in this. And that's kind of they've almost written themselves into a corner, and I mentioned that on uh, in one of my Alan Wake videos as well. And now that they have this flashback kind of thing, either they're gonna have to completely change that around in the next one, or they're gonna have to stick with it's light and it's dark. And Alan Wake 
does a great job of light safe, darkness bad, you know, and when this takes some of those elements, but not quite all of them, like, there's never a during the day sequence where you're entirely safe, you know, the, yeah, so, in this one there just is that kind of, yeah, it, it just, it needed more of a change to properly fit, you know, and in this one, Alan's almost like an action hero, again, he's standing there with the, the nail gun, where in the first he was just this, it explored him as a character, he was this obsessed, kind of troubled novelist, and in this, he kind of still is, but he doesn't really explore it. So, so yes, the, the overall, you, you have some problems there. I should mention also, I mentioned before, you have a flare gun, handheld flares, and a, you know, and, and flashbangs. The flare you can either hold or drop, depending on whether you just quickly press the button for it or if you hold it down. And you can't walk with it, but you walk slowly, and you can't, like, I don't think you can shoot or any kind of thing because, you know, you're holding it and you're holding it in the right hand, so, yeah. But it will force the enemies away and the flare gun is, you know, it's like a grenade launcher for this, you know, the, the light takes away the shadow and enough light, so both the flare gun and the flashbang will kill the the taken by you know completely taking away that yeah taking away so so yeah now the and you know it is it is maybe a little harsh for you know these two games to title the the evil that you have to fight the taken I mean yeah, the movies have a pretty reprehensible view on women, but, you know, right, anyway, yeah, so, that's one area where it upgrades, upgrades the, the shooting, another is that we do get a few new enemies, and the thing here is that these enemies really aren't that interesting, like, okay, Perhaps the most interesting is the splitter, which has no darkness, but it's also, you know, you have to just shoot it. If you shine a light on it, especially if you boost light on it, it will, like, split Hydra style, and you now have, you know, twice as many splitters to deal with. And yes, it does keep doing this. And they get, like, smaller and smaller, if I recall, so, yeah. I try to avoid, as you might understand, I try to avoid shining light on them. The annoying thing with this is, you can't shine the, you, you know, you can't shoot. The flashlight beam is the, the targeting reticle, the, the crosshairs. So, you can't avoid shining the light on. And there are tons of times in this where... I shot at someone, poss possibly them, possibly someone else. I wasn't boosting the flashlight, and it counted as them being flashed on. And it's like, what am I supposed to do? There's no, I can't be sure that I only light on the other guy. They, you know, both enemies are moving, and I have to also be shooting. I have to keep track of other enemies. So, yeah, it's just... It's kind of irritating that way, and again, that was the best of the new enemies. Another is spiders. So, yeah, I, I guess, you know, what was it, Doctor something, you know, Legion of Spiders had, you know, a, a hand in designing enemies for this game. They're not that interesting. They, they burrow out of the ground, so that's... A decent little thing, but yeah, and and you can kill them either with gunfire or by lighting on them. Now the third 
is a big guy who takes a lot of light and a lot of gunfire to take out. You know, an another one. Because the first game, and they returned in this game for, for comparison, already had that. And that one is actually much more interesting. Not only was it the original, so, you know, obviously, you know, the whole purest thing of obviously it's better. No, it's actually, like, it can force its way through the, the light even when boosted. And it, of course, takes a while for you to boost away its shadow. And it'll, it'll force its way through and then attack you. So, yeah, you literally do have to be really, really careful with that one and, and get away from it. And, yeah, it, it does, like, try to charge at you. I'm not sure if it did that in the first one or if that's a change. If it is an addition, then certainly that fits. But, yeah, the, the only real thing to the new one, it's bigger and it's got this chainsaw kind of thing, but that's it. You know, it's not even, like, The House of the Dead 2 has a boss enemy, which is huge, and it carries around and swings wildly a chainsaw, which is, you know, appropriate in size. I mean, this guy, one of his legs is about the size of a grown man, so that gives you an idea of, and you gotta shoot him in the head, and as he's approaching you, he's just barely covering his head with the chainsaw. So you have to wait for him to try to attack with the chainsaw, where he, he'll pull it back or have it above his head. There you can shoot his head. That's awesome. That's very, you know, the, the chainsaw is both his weapon, so it's really dangerous like that. It's also his main defense, because it, it keeps you from being able to shoot his head. And obviously, it has the, the you know, the life bar, where you gotta keep shooting until eventually, you know, the life is drained and he's dead. Nothing like that here. He's, it's just, you know, he'll, he'll lift it and then he'll pull it out. And you just gotta dodge it, just same as every other enemy. And yeah, I guess it does more damage, but it's not an interesting concept, though. Oh yeah, and there's, there's another guy. Okay, so I guess five new enemies. There's a guy who, he comes out of these ravens, and if you don't shoot him fast enough, he can become Ravens again and reassemble, which it's it's fine. I'm just not sure this is necessarily the best game for it. I feel like that might work really well in a Silent Hill game, where even the appearance of an enemy can be really threatening. But in this, you're swarmed by enemies. There are enemies all the time. Not every single second, and not always like these really tough ones, but the fact that you have like a dozen enemies in front of you isn't like, oh man, I really gotta be careful. I mean, I just beat, like, Silent Hill Downpour. You know, just having a couple of enemies at the same time was like, oh man, what am I gonna do? Can, can I run somewhere? You know, and in this, there are so many, so it's not really for, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to take out, take down every single new design. I'm not saying that everything new in this is bad, but that is kind of yeah. Now, among the settings are a drive-in theater and an observatory. One thing I would really say about this is, rather than upgrading and increasing the action, you know, focusing on the action, this is very battle-oriented, they should have just went for maybe a co-op experience, because in the first I mean, the whole thing with, with shining a light and, and also firing a gun really lends itself to that. And in the first, you also have these sequences where you're driving a car and maybe some Taken will appear in the road in front of you, and you can, like, drive, you know, you can run them over. But that won't necessarily kill them. If you haven't lit enough, and they can, they can damage your car to the point where you have to get out of the car, and if you're lucky, there's another car nearby. Otherwise, you're just going to have to make some of the journey on foot. And you can boost the, the, the light in. That's where it makes the most sense. You know, you can do the, you know, I, I think cars have that. Some cars have the thing where they can boost the light for driving when it's really, really dark. Not sure how many flashlights you can boost like that. But 
you know, we forgive that kind of thing because it's a great gameplay element. Now, that really lends itself well to, I mean, when you're driving around that car, maybe the, uh, the co-op player can be, you know, shooting. Maybe he can be controlling the, the light. The thing with Alan Wake 1, when you're driving, a lot of the time it's a fairly straightforward. You're just making the journey. You know, you're driving from point A to point B. It's not a maze you're going through. They could do a co-op where they, where it is, you know, a bit of a maze. You know, where, where you have to be really careful. Where you maybe have to keep moving. Maybe there's darkness behind, so you do have to keep driving, and you gotta watch where you're going. And they're taken like chasing you, and they will damage the car if you don't take them out. Okay, have a guy with a flashlight and a gun in the car, and there you've got a co-op. You know, in the main thing. Maybe have one character carry a flying spot, or maybe just have this, this cover kind of thing where you're, you know, shining a light. One, one of the two players is in a lit area where he's safe, and he's shining a light on where the other one is running with only a gun or something like that, you know. Or the reverse, maybe a guy is sitting up there with a, a machine gun, okay, a sniper. And he's, you know, the other one has to light, and then maybe suddenly, you know, the, the gun or, or light thing up with the guy in the tower falls apart, you know, something, you know, overcharged, maybe the light burns out, and the other guy has to run back and protect him, you know. This could work, and this would be compelling. I'm not saying that it should have been in Alan Wake 1, but I am saying that if you want to expand the experience, then do something like that. Don't try to work with an element that really... Alan Wake is not about action. It's... You know, you... you the, the action is okay, but it is more about the story and atmosphere. Now, the... Like I mentioned, there's, there's only the two difficulty settings, and it's a short game. It's really not... There isn't that much replayability, like, basically what you have is that the, the manuscript pages, as I mentioned, will, you know, unlock more weapons, so there's that, you know, and, you know, they will more inform what is really going on, but it's really not... Yeah, it's, it's just not very... It's not enough, you might say. Actually, come to think of it, there is one more, at least one more, new enemy. And basically he has this weapon which... There are flashbangs of, of darkness. Yeah! I'll be okay. So anyway, basically, if they were going to do this and, and change around things, why didn't they fix the minor issues that there were with the first Alan Wake? This, as so many new games, has an issue whenever you're trying to pick up things and they're like grouped closely together. And this, they're almost always in a group. And if, if you're trying to pick up something from that group, and it says, you know, carry capacity full for that one, it doesn't just cycle through to the next one. You know, you might eventually just have to abandon even trying to pick that thing up. Why doesn't it either cycle through or pick everything up it can from that group? If, yeah, if they're going to change things, it's, this seems like a place that you would, you know, try to focus on. I suppose that more or less. Like I've already somewhat said, the plot here is self-contained. You don't have to play the first one, and suddenly it doesn't really, it doesn't particularly spoil the first one, or the two DLC chapters, but it is just, yeah, it also does end up feeling kind of pointless, especially because it's not as fun or surreal and creative 
with that whole thing as the, you know, the two chapters that were DLC for the first game. And I suppose that about covers it. And I should note, for, for anyone wondering, yes, the fact that I'm not doing a Thoughts On video for this is in fact because there is not particularly anything to talk about there. There's so little with characters, and there are things I could spoil here, but they're not even... The parts of this that would be, be you know, considered spoiled, spoiler material, I can reliably inform you, wouldn't be worth spoiling, even if I, you know, yeah, okay, that reference didn't completely work out. And on that note, I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.